projects, we love collaborating with artists to develop interactive visitor experiences. And we see art as, as this vehicle to make science and natural phenomenon a lot more approachable, fun, and memorable for, for the visitor. And we, one of the things we always try to have the outcome is that ideally the visitor can add a layer or activate the art to build a, a personal connection. And so I, I think there's a real opportunity to start bringing that approach to interactive art in our community. And I see hands-on's role could be to help assist in developing concepts in terms of you know, visitor experiences, the budgeting, the fabrication process and installation. Excellent, thanks so much, Greg. And next we have Leslie Tharp, who is a uh, metal artist and uh, installer from uh, Gainesville. Leslie. Hi, yep, so I'm Leslie Tharp. I'm over in Gainesville, Florida, and I've worked with Mary Ann on a project, which is behind me, and I'm so glad to be here today. So I have my own shop. I run out of the business name, Leslie Tharp Designs, LLC, and I also teach hands-on blacksmithing classes and welding classes, and I work under Beaver Metal Arts Center for that. Um, I kind of came into this whole industry as somebody who really liked to work with metal and I and I wanted to build big work and I really wanted it to be placed in public spaces specifically outside of galleries. Um, and so I've just kind of slowly plucked away at building up a career full of portfolio items that that um, work towards that and uh, building up a metal shop so that I can do that so I can keep building bigger and bigger. So I'm both the designer and uh, the builder, and many times I'm also the installer. So I'm, I'm happy to share anything I've learned because I definitely think there are uh, mysteries to entering this field. And hopefully that doesn't have to be so difficult for newer artists that are wanting to get involved. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Ailing is uh, over there with a lot of books behind him. And Mark is an incredible sculptor from St. Petersburg, Florida. Hello. Uh, thank you, Wayne. Um, <clears throat> I'm Mark Ailing, and I own and operate MGA Sculpture Studio, LLC, and uh, have been um, making things for a living my entire adult life. Um, I believe the last time I was employed uh, doing something that wasn't involved in making something for a living was delivering pizzas my sophomore year of high school or excuse me, sophomore year of college. So I've um, been doing this a long time. And, and I mentioned that because it, it relates to how I got involved in, in doing public art. Um, you know, when you're trying to make a living making things and sculpture is what always really attracted me. Um, it's, it's an expensive endeavor and, and having a space um, and, and the capacity to make things. Public art was very attractive to me because there's a, a a pocket of money that's sitting there that's going to be spent on something. And um, if you can pitch a good idea and, uh, and convince people you're capable of doing it, then you can get access to those funds and um, somebody else pays to make the piece you wanna make, which is a great thing and everybody wins. Um, you know, from a sculptural perspective, I found entering into the world of, um, uh, alternative sales, gallery sales, that sort of thing, really challenging because it took a lot of capital. If you wanna, if you wanna sell bronzes in galleries, um, you have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in inventory in, in various spaces in, in, the, in the places you have. So um, if you don't have those kinds of resources or, or work very methodically to build those kinds of resources, public art is a, is a great way to, um, to finance the work that you wanna make. There's much more to it than that, but that's one of the things that, that drew me to, to the process. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you so much, Mark. And uh, Cecilia Luisa, uh, who's got uh, artwork around the, the state as well. Go ahead, Cecilia. Hi, Wayne, hello, everyone. Yes, we are Cecilia Luisa Projects. Uh, we're a team, husband and wife team, where I'm the lead artist. Um, we focus on sculpture, mural art, and 3D installations, multimedia installations. Um, we love um, large projects, so we're always up for that, for the challenge. 
I'm from Argentina originally. I came to the United States 20 years ago. And <clears throat> shortly after arriving, I came across some amazing public art uh, pieces here. And that's when I, I realized that um, art can have a bigger, a bigger and lasting impact if shared with people from all walks of life. And that's when I realized that I wanted to be a public artist. So here we are. Excellent, thanks so much. So far we've uh, uh, heard from, from people who can help you with the design, the fabrication, the engineering, the permitting, uh, the installation, all of those things and the inspiration that you can get from other artists. But uh, it all goes before a public arts commission at some point or a selection committee. Um, and so uh, the, the final panelist that I would like to introduce is David Ramsey, who can certainly speak to that uh, uh, um, amongst a lot of other subjects. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. And I will also mention that Mariana Murphy is uh, past chair of the Public Arts Commission in uh, St. Petersburg. So I'll let her uh, chime in if she has some extra thoughts too. But uh, I currently sit on the Public Arts Commission uh, in St. Petersburg, which Wayne uh, is staffed to, and uh, been there for, it seems, six years, I think. And uh, the uh, Public Arts Commission in St. Petersburg has just gotten through spending, I want to say, three to four million dollars on public art. And uh, so we're fresh from having done a lot of different uh, searches, uh, small and large, uh, some uh, benign, some very politically sensitive. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, I, I think I can speak to, to some of the uh, ways that people have uh, maneuvered and, and, and got through the challenge. Uh, others, uh, unfortunately, you know, fail for different reasons. And hopefully we can give you some ideas as to how to avoid doing that. Thank you so much, David. All right. So before you, you know, we, we see a lot of public art projects and it, the, the one simple thing is, if you don't apply, you won't get it. And it seems like a very, very simple thing, um, but you have to apply in order to be considered. And so it, some of the artists who are here on the, uh, the Zoom meeting might not even be familiar with Coda Works or Cafe or something like that, but our artist friends here certainly are. Um, and so I'd like to ask Mark to really address that a little bit. Um, how do you get started? Um, talk about some of the um, things that are important getting started. Um, and where can you go for, for calls to artists? And, and how do you build that portfolio so that at some point you get in front of people like David Ramsey or Mariana Murphy? Um. Yeah, I, you know, I think it was Woody Allen who said that 99% of success in life is based on just showing up. Um, so you, you got to be there uh, um, in order to move forward. But in order to get there, um, you know, it's, it's a little challenging because you got to have the work to get the work. Um, these uh, primarily municipalities are, uh, you know, this percent for art um, uh, programs that are set up through municipalities where the funds generally come, for, th come from that support the industry of public art, um, they don't want to waste their funds. So they want to make sure that they are investing their resources. They, they feel a responsibility to those municipalities that they invest those resources in, in artists, individuals, companies that are capable of executing what they're pitching. And um, that means you got to have a track record and you can get into some of the smaller budget uh, projects by just showing competent work. But in order to get into the upper echelon, um, some of the larger budget projects, you got to have them to get them. And the only way to do that is to, to find a way in. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of different ways to go about that. Uh, one is to, you know, start with the small and, you know, the, the, $1,000 projects for, for this or that and get them under your belt and start to build a resume that way. Um, another way to do that is to work for another artist who does it and, and um, through that exposure, you can build a portfolio. Um, I actually have people on, on my team. I have, I have another number of artists that work for me who, who um, a, a couple of them have, have 
express interest in public art and I have basically sponsored them or um, co-applied for a project to more or less guarantee that that project will be um, uh, executed successfully. So partnering with another artist is a really good way to get your feet wet. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, the other way is to get commissions, um, whether they're, they're private commissions or, or commissions through development or commercial commissions, but showing a track record of, of pitching an idea and executing it um, is, is another way of doing that. Um, and all of this comes down to how you show all these things in your resume. Every one of these applications that goes out or, or calls that goes out, they're asking for specific information. Another possibility is to generate concepts and put them in situations. And, and when you can, you can show those as part of your body of work, some, some of these calls will say, you know, only existing projects. And of course you can't do that. You don't want to lie. Those, those, that kind of stuff gets around. <clears throat> if you're trying to deceive, that's a bad idea. You got to be honest about what you've done. But you can um, come up with concepts and and put them in situations. Walk around the city and find cool spots and and create models and and work in the computer and and show what the potential is. So that's another way to do it. Um, and I, I'm going on kind of long here, so I'll I'll touch just briefly on on some of these th this other point. Cafe and Coda Works. Another one is publicartist.org uh, is another listserv, and many of these opportunities are available through multiple listservs, but to this day, CAFE is probably the, still the biggest um, and most widely used. It, it looked like CodaWorks was gonna um, step beyond that. It's got a slightly broader platform, but they've been struggling a little bit in the last year or so. Um, they've had some issues with their website and, uh, and you know, I think it's really negatively impacted them as an organization. Um, but my, my business applies for hundreds of calls and it's a numbers game. Um, when I first started doing this, I could send out 30 or 40 applications. And when you start, they can take you days to put together and it's a commitment. Um, and you got to put those applications out over and over and over again and not be afraid to hear no. Um, I've sat on a couple panels and, and that's a great experience because through that you learn that it's not personal. When you've got an application that's national or in international and there's 300, 400 artists applying for these things, that panel is looking for reasons to get rid of people. Um, so, you know, there's a whole process to how you put your letter together and your information that, that gets you in the mix. Um, we can probably talk a little bit more about that, but I don't want to dominate conversation here, so I'll pass on. So, so excellent. And, and um, Cecilia, how about, you know, you've done a variety of, of things from, from painting to sculpture and, and so forth. Uh, maybe speak to the same thing that, that Mark had talked about. Um, you know, how do you really get into that? And how do you take something that f from somebody who is a painter to turn it into a sculpture and, and, and build your resume? And, and where do you go to look for, for work? Well, uh, yeah, it's, it can be challenging uh, at first, but, you know, over time you find ways to, to get into, you know, um, public art, the public art uh, game, I guess. Uh, I wanna share a personal uh, experience. <clears throat> I, I was trained as a painter, but I really wanted to be a sculptor as well. And back in 2002, I came across this call to artists for temporary sculpture in Orlando. <clears throat> I didn't have anything to show, but I have, you know, a model. So I talked to someone at uh, Orlando City Hall and I tell them that I have this idea <clears throat> that I wanted to, you know, to uh, to create and, and and show, you know, and uh, so we drove all the way from Miami. We we're living in Miami at the time, all the way to from Miami to Orlando to show them this maquette of the sculpture that I wanted to um, to fabricate for the show. So that was, you know, if you have that passion and you know, you have nothing, but you have that passion to, 
to go out there and do maybe something that's not the normal uh, process, you know, the, of things like, you know, jumping into the car and driving all the way to show your, your work and, and your ideas. And I think you can make it. And I'm glad I did. Uh, those were the, the very first sculptures we did back in 2002. I'm, I won't do the, that again, but <laughs> I'm glad it happened. So, but I will say, you know, start with a small commission and uh, you need to have good references that really helps people really that know your ethic, uh, work ethic and your, the quality of your work uh, overall and that can speak for you. That, that really helps and a small commission will help you, uh, it will be less stressful and let you um, learn a bit about the, the process. Um, so nothing is gonna prepare you for the trials and <laughs> tribulations of, uh, and the joys that, um, that come with this uh, profession. But one thing is for sure, and uh, uh, with every experience, with every project, you're gonna get better and better at what you do. And, <clears throat> you know, better at managing the, the process, understanding the materials, understanding the whole situation. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great thing to do. And Leslie, you have certainly uh, got quite a lot of experience too, also breaking into this and, 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 and involved in a variety of projects. Uh, if you could talk about how, how you got in and, and any advice you have got for somebody who not necessarily has, has done any and, and where do you really start and build that resume? Yeah, absolutely. So when I came out of college, I had some sculpting skills under my belt and some experience actually presenting a concept to my professors and then carrying it into being something I was gonna get a grade on. So some of the public art application process sounded kind of familiar at first for me. I said, oh yes, I can put together good visuals and talk about my concept. Um, but I know for some peers that I was surrounded you know, with at that time, that was a learning curve in and of itself. So I think you kind of play to the strengths you have when you start. Um, but I got in with a couple really low budget projects that I also now I couldn't afford to do something like that, but it gave me the chance, not just for exposure, but really the trials and tribulations, like Cecilia said, it's, there's, there's no way to know it all until you've just started kind of plucking away at that process. Um, so that was kind of the entry point. And I think that's good advice. I really like what Mark said as well about you know, if you can build your own portfolio bit by bit and find a way to sort of self-finance those steps, because as we know, it's extremely time consuming and it can be very financially demanding. So there's definitely a lifestyle juggling act that probably needs to get developed just to try to get your, your feet off the ground there. Um, but partnering up with artists or mentors of any type that can even give you some guidance on the back end, I think helps tremendously. Some of my biggest um, supporters at the time were people who could talk about how to install the work when it was done. Just the things that were sort of out of my regular practice and felt um, really daunting at the time. So in retrospect, I look back at those people and I'm just so grateful because I really had a lot to learn with some of this stuff, you know. Excellent. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, Next, let's take a look at, at, again, all of these things will go before a, a some type of a, a citizen volunteer committee to select the art. And David has served on a number of those, so has Mariana, so feel free to, to either one of you chime in. But um, talk about what you're looking for in submissions and, and one submission or one artist might be perfect for this project and maybe not for another. Um, what you're looking at, how the process works. Um, and then we'll, uh, go to, to, to Greg and, and back to Leslie and, and uh, explain how an artist can then uh, pull this together using all these resources. So um, David, go ahead. Okay. First thing that everybody here needs to understand, and I'm sure Mark and uh, Leslie and uh, Cecilia can vouch for this, uh, you're going before a committee and usually a public committee. Be prepared to go slow, like glacial, Sometimes things look like nothing is happening and it's just the nature of committees. 
The second thing is um, the choice of the committee is that it's a majority rules. It's not necessarily, uh, if I love a piece, uh, I'll go lobby like crazy for it in front of the group. But if my taste is a little more extreme or uh, in a different direction than the, um, whoever the committee is, and the committee could be made up of citizens, architects, artists, uh, business people, it, it could be any combination. It doesn't always have to be just people that are familiar with good art. And I also have a cat here who wants to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I would say that things to keep in mind, uh, most committees are looking for community involvement. So uh, if it's gonna be a big public piece sitting out in the middle of somewhere, uh, you need to know what that committee is going through. Uh, we wanna make sure if you can involve local people, if it's a question of you know designing something that fits a theme, be aware of what's going on in the, sit in the, uh, the city. Uh, does the size fit? Uh, do your research and find out where the space is supposed to be. Is it inside? Is it outside? Uh, does your work in your own eye fit, com you know, in a compatible compatible way with the architecture, uh, or is it just going to sit there and just sort of, you know, blink like I don't really belong here? Uh, if you can sort of, you know, think ahead, you'll save yourself some problems. Uh, as far as um, also, uh, be aware of some of the calls are going to really, even though they won't say it, they're looking for local artists. They would prefer to keep uh, the money and uh, help the local art community. Other times, uh, you, if you are applying across the, the country and uh, you may actually you know, have a better chance than a local artist because uh, again, you know, Mark can talk to this because he's uh, very successful locally as well as in, uh, nationally. Uh, but there are sometimes, you know, you're just going to get excluded because you aren't one of those. If you aren't local, then, you know, you probably won't get the, uh, the selection. Uh, on the other hand, if your art is new to the committee, uh, you might even find yourself, uh, you know, moving up to the top of the list just because you're different. So, Marianne, what would else would you add? One of the things is before all of this, the Public Art Commission meets and does does their homework and figures out, they say, all right, well, we've got a new building or a new situation where we want to put a piece of public art. All right, well, so what do we have in our budget? What do we think we want to put out there for that? Can we get some private donations and let's craft a budget? So is it going to be indoor or outdoor? Um, do we need to do it in with the building as it's being built as, for instance, terrazzo floor? Do we have time to do that? Because that usually takes nine months or so. Do we, uh, and can we leverage some of the flooring money to, to go into a public arts budget, for instance? So all this stuff is all very well defined by the time a call to artists goes out. So there's, um, there is a lot of homework to do, as David said, to, to exactly match the needs of that call to artists. Uh, and don't, don't go off the reservation because uh, it's super hard for a committee who's got their mind filled with exactly kind of, it's going to be here and it's not going to be a piece of plop sculpture, but it's going to, it's going to relate to the building or whatever for you to come in and say, wow, I got a great idea. It's going to look like this. And it's, it'll be more successful if you, if you slavishly follow the call to artists. All right. And so you've got, um, it is good to, I tried to glance through the list of, uh, people here and it's good to see some uh some local uh, talent that i recognize the names of who might not necessarily have got a uh, a large commission but um if you take a potter uh someone who creates pottery and primarily does vases that person very well could be a public artist you could take that and scale it up to a very, very large sculpture. They may not be thinking that. Same thing with a painter who typically paints sea turtles or, or um, landscapes or whatever that is. Take that and take that design and convert it into public art. Same with, same with a, a glass blower. You can take all of these various talents and turn them into public art. And there's somebody, there's several here that um, Leslie and Greg can certainly help moving you from that 
besides the, the basics of being on the, the cafe and, and so forth and, and answering the calls, how do you actually get the, that idea from your head into something that's public art that the, the public is going to want? There's all sorts of things with engineering and permitting and uh, architecture and, and so forth that may be very, very daunting, but I, we know that there are people here on this call who will certainly succeed and can do that. Um, but it's with the help of somebody like Greg or Leslie who can do it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Greg, who I believe has got some some slides and so forth and and is a wealth of information. And, and um, I'm a former client. We built a science center over in Volusia County that, that uh, Greg supplied all of the work for and he's an incredibly talented um, guy. So please give him a listen and, and um, he'll help you out. On the lightning share. Is it sharing? Are you seeing my screen? My yes. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly walk through an interactive sculpture that we're designing for a children's museum outdoor space because it goes through the same process that that we're talking about here today. And so this is a, a sculpture, it's a it's large scale, it's a it's a two octave pipe organ that kids play by slapping the open ends of PVC pipes with a little foam paddle and they create musical notes. So what we're really looking at, how do we, how do we meld art and, and science? So we, we start very simply with an iPad and a $10 drawing application called Procreate. It's a super powerful program. I can't believe they sell it for $10. But the, and the real key for us at the very beginning is to do lots of rapid iterations. Since you're working in 3D and large scale, just really thinking real out of the box about different ways to approach this problem. Since we're typically working around a science concept or some natural phenomenon, and we've got a little bit of a kernel of where we want to go, and then we're just exploring that using more of a our, our artistic approach to it. If we're collaborating with an artist on this, they would be starting with the concept and we would just be helping them start to flesh that out. So once we sort of get a you know, little concept we like, we'll then immediately go to 3D modeling. And we use a program called SolidWorks, which is a pretty high-end program, uh, can do really sophisticated modeling, but SketchUp is a great program, very popular. They have a free version. It's, it's not super expensive, but, but I really encourage you to, to try to use 3D modeling for when you're working in, in scale like this, because it, it's so easy to sort of move around them. Uh, it's, it's easy to do multiple iterations from it. You can set it in the site and really start to get a sense of, of what that really feels like and 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 to David's point of that it it really feels right for the scale of where you're where you're going and the, the committee is going to be able to visualize that. Um, we find that that clients really like seeing things in 3D and, and see the different ways that they that it might be viewed. Like in this case we're we're doing a lighting design with it. So we're able to show the client and the funder what it looks like at daytime, what it looks like at a night event. Because there's a lot of folks that really have a difficult time translating from a 2D drawing to something that's that's 3D. And with, with all of these programs, you can do fly-throughs. So you can really take them, just embed them in the experience. 3D modeling or 3D printing has gotten super cost effective. So you can do a small scale model of, of what, what you're doing. And, it, and again, it, it'll just, I think it helps selection committees. It certainly helps with our clients and, and our funders. Then our next step after it gets approved by the client is we start going into to, to detail on how it's gonna actually be built, okay? So we're, we're getting it to a level that we can give it to a fabricator and get preliminary budgeting on it. Is it. This is the point where you've got a concept, everybody's on board with it, but we just wanna be sure that you're in budget. Is it, are we over budget on materials? Do we need to, do we need to simplify? Do we need to, to, to modify it in any way? And once you know that you're sort of in that, 
you're in the budget window, you're at least between the guardrails. If we need a structural engineer, this is the point that we would hire the structural engineer to really get an understanding of, of what we're, what we need to add to our budget or modify in our budget for, for the, um, for structural. We then internally do the construction documents for the final bidding by the fabricator. And then that final fabricator is gonna handle the permitting, make the shop drawings that we would review, build the piece and install it. So in, in this case of public art, what hands on could do is help you sort of move through that concepting process and just, as Leslie said, there's just, you learn so much by, by people you know, mentoring you and just helping you not step in the same hole that, that we've all stepped in. We've been doing this a long time. Um, it's, it's a really, for us, it's a really exciting uh, process to be working outdoors. And, and we just love the idea of, of art becoming more interactive. That's good. Okay. Excellent, Greg. Good. Thank you so much. Let, Leslie, similar, um, similar uh, you know, question. How, what advice have you got for how do you get somebody who is a, a painter or a potter mm -hmm. moving in that direction? Yeah, I mean, I think the first step is figuring out what part of your practice would translate successfully into a public space. Um, sometimes the focus of these calls is to just make sure that the investment, like Mark had kind of spoken to, is uh, made well. So sometimes that's a durability issue. And I know that a lot of artists will translate maybe image development or texture or color, things that work with their maybe studio process or gallery process, but it needs to be put into a different medium to fit well in that space. Sometimes there's a more fluid transition and what you're working with could be in a space if it was interior versus exterior or maybe suspended instead of within reach. And I think, you know, we're all creative thinkers here. So part of the fun is to kind of figure out how that works and, um, and, and just in really thinking outside the box and a lot of times your public art portfolio will be different than your gallery portfolio. Um, a lot of what we're doing with public art is almost facilitating what the board wants to see in that space. So they obviously need an artist's brain and an artist's touch to come in and give this piece um, some life. But we're, for me anyways, often I'm very much like taking in what their intentions are, what we want to speak to. I personally like to work a lot with environmental um, ecology around the spaces that I work within. And that's always fun. It's always like very interesting for me to like get into the nitty gritty of what is really special to that location. So I'm not necessarily entering an application process or a discussion with a client um, just from what I would make in my own studio, because oftentimes that's way off the wall and it doesn't relate enough to what, you know, they would prefer to see in that location. So I think that's sort of, that's the initial brainstorming that's going to need to happen. And then we're getting into some logistics. And from my experience, a lot of times I start with budget because I can really make some big expensive stuff, but if the budget's not there, the budget's not there, right? So I kind of start there and I start working back from the design. I'll maybe have some concepts I'm kind of tossing around and then I'm just trying to figure out how can I stretch that money the farthest to, to give a good product that's going to hold up for years, but to also give something that can maybe feel impactful or large in that space, even if the budget is not a huge budget. Can I take out some of the time consuming detail you know, in some places to give a bigger picture look. I mean, I think you can kind of toy a little bit with where do you want to invest your time and resources to get the most bang for your buck. And oftentimes committees are kind of juggling that same situation. They don't have an endless budget. And like Mariana said, um, it's really important that you, you enter that discussion process with like full recognition that you are hearing what their needs are um, because they, you know, they have to work within those parameters. 
And, and then sometimes you get more leniency. Like sometimes um, just in the last few years, I've had more and more of an interest just in what, you know, I would bring to the table if I got to choose. And it's a bit of a shift in my career because I'm going, wait, really? You, <laughs> you're a little more open to just sort of what's happening in my head. And, and that's really fun, but it's always different. And I do a ton of commission work. And a lot of times we're juggling that same kind of dance, like how much, how much of my ideas do you want versus how much of me facilitating your ideas do you need from me? And I'm really happy to do both, but I think public art is very much focused on, on that conversation in every single situation. So does that, I hope that kind of answers how to get started there. And of course there's logistics of how to, how to communicate clearly and move through that planning step and execute cleanly and have a successful um, project by the end. Well, we shall see if everybody on this call gets a uh, Coda Works or Cafe uh, uh, profile set up within the next 30 days, we'll be successful. <laughs> Are you taking um, a commission on those signups? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's free to sign up, isn't it? Oh, uh, or yeah, to respond. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, there's, so there's no reason to, to not do it. Um, there are a lot of uh, calls to artists for, for 2D work, and I know that there are um, some, some who are involved in murals and that on the, the call. How, how do you then, how do you move to answer some of these calls um, as a, a painter or a muralist um, for some of the 2D works? And, and Cecilia is sort of the um, expert on that. So why don't we start with Cecilia and how do you, how do you move to, to answer some of these calls for, for murals? And I know you've done some from, fairly large ones um, over the years in, I believe down in Broward County um, and other places, certainly. Um, how do you move from, from somebody who has just done small works or small murals um, to, to your first real commission? How do you get there? Yes, well, um, you never done a mural before. Um, I'll say um, submit your best work, you know, studio work, and your ideas for that particular project. Um, I was there before. I never did a painted a large mural before, and I had to. I presented an idea, and with you know uh, samples of my studio work, and I got the project. So let's do that. And you know references, as I said before, the, that helps. But um, Thankfully, when it comes to mural, <clears throat> uh, mural art uh, projects, um, it's, it's more relaxed. Everything is more relaxed because you know um, it doesn't need that much. Uh, you know, uh, you don't need uh, engineering. You know, or you need you need to go through very the complex stuff. Just you know, permitting. But sometimes the client is going to take care of that. You know. To get the permit for you to paint on the wall and um so I was, to me like painting mirrors like a walk in the park <laughs> it's like it's, it's fun uh compared to other type of uh public art projects you know 3d especially 3d art um but yes uh you never done a mural before just present uh, your ideas and your work, your studio work, and the best you have there, and you know, and a, a nice letter because communication skills are very important, also. And I'm sure you know. Uh, nowadays, I know some of uh, some projects don't require a uh, public art experience. There are some of them that you know you don't need to have uh, any work done before applying. So that's good. And you have your portfolio and uh, qualifications and so forth also uh, online and, and the various platforms. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Usually you um, like cafe, well, you know, cafe, you have to, um, yeah, you have, re you submit your resume there and, uh, you know, every project is different. So, and the submission requirements also. Sometimes they just want, you know, some work samples and uh, a bio. And other times they're gonna ask you for references and, uh, you know, uh, 
the work scope, uh, the project scope, and what do you, um, what you want to do that project, and what you, you know, every project is, you know, the easier the better. But, but yeah, sometimes you have to, yeah, it's a, applying is a process. Thankfully, nowadays you can do everything online. Back in the day, we have to submit CDs, and I remember running a lot of CDs, and that was, <laughs> that was quite a task. But you know, it's, uh, we have the, the you know the internet now, so that's streamline things a little. We've come a long way from slides and CDs. Oh yes, oh yes, yeah. Um, and and Mark, um, you had mentioned earlier that that you had partnered with some um, some others who had worked with you, and I, I remember seeing some of those applications uh, over the years. And it was heartwarming to see somebody take another artist under their wing to help them to reach their, their wishes and dreams and their, their capabilities. Um, and there are plenty of those artists out there. If you could maybe talk to that a little bit um, and, and how to help others and, and what advice you've got for somebody who has not done anything or perhaps is um, a, a painter or in another area who's, who's looking to maybe break into to public art or who certainly has that capability and maybe never thought about it. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, working with other artists is a, is a really great way to gain experience and exposure to processes and, and ways of approaching things that otherwise you might not get access to. You know, I, I have a, B, a BFA in sculpture and an MFA in sculpture, and I learned a lot about art with a capital A um, in, in those environments and the history of art and, and uh, how to generate ideas and concept and the different movements in art. But um, the practical application of making things I learned more about that uh, working for the Seattle Opera for three years, making opera scenery. And um, working in that shop environment was, was hugely inspirational for me and really informed my process um, because they're, you're taking um, an idea, either someone else's rendering or, or concept, and and, and manifesting it into reality. So um, how, to, how to work from a rendering that's this big and, and put a grid on it and use a scale ruler um, and, and scale that up and, and paint it so it's 30 feet high and 60 feet long. Those are very valuable skills. Um, you know, public art is, is not a spontaneous endeavor. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of consideration, and um, you have to be able to have an idea, and and be able to execute that idea through a variety of machinations. Um, so if if you're an artist who wants to be in your studio and and get the mood music going and and do that one thing that makes that thing work for you, that's that's wonderful. But that is not public art. Public art is having that connection and then being able to reiterate it through a variety of machinations, materials, processes, engineering committees, and still come out on the other end with something that relates to or ties into your original concept. Um, and, and it takes uh, stepping away from your process a little bit and learning a, a bigger picture of experience and, and work. I, it's, I, I'm coming back to this idea of working in another person's shop or in a commercial shop or, or a, another way of, of making and, and seeing that bigger picture. The most inspiring experience I have ever had as an artist was working on a major motion picture and seeing um, a vision that a, a director, an art director, a, um, a cinematographer and a writer, all these people who have, they sit in a room and they talk about a story and they communicate what their intent is. And then through literally thousands of people, they manage that creative intent. And when you experience that process firsthand, you realize 
how incredibly magical it is that a good movie is ever made because those people have such clarity of vision and understanding of process and ability to um, incorporate all of those different variables into that endeavor. Um, that's, that's in a nutshell what, what public art really is. So if you like to paint, step, paint something small, step back, put a grid on it and paint it big and, and feel that experience, learn how that image is translated. Um, that's, you know, there, that's an invaluable experience in relation to public art. Excellent, thanks so much. What, the, 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 the not so fun part of um, public art or really any art, you've got the budgeting and the, the writing of the narrative uh, um, on your, uh, the applications. And I, I know I've read some of the narratives um, from, from you, Mark, and, and Mark has did the um, artwork for our police station. And um, the narratives for that were absolutely incredible. It was so tied into it. Talk to us a little bit uh, about the um, creating the narrative and some of the other things that, that um, might be a little off-putting to, to people looking to get into art, the engineering and the, the permitting and, and the insurance and some of those types of, of things without scaring anybody. Were you asking me? Yeah, go ahead and start with you, Mark. Um, so, um, you know, once you've gotten through the process of, of, of um, the initial application, the, the request for qualifications, and, and you get through those hurdles and, and you get to that fortunate place of being shortlisted. So it's been culled down from hundreds to a handful. Um, then a little bit of money changes hands and uh, you get asked to put a concept together. And um, at that point, you have to dig into the research part of the project. and um the doing your research is is the the critical part of success in in relation to getting that project and you have to be able to connect your idea with what um what that that commissioning body is interested in and they give you clues when they put the call out there are always a few key sentences that will tell you what their inspiration is um, or what they're looking for, what, what they want to accomplish with the public art. And the way that I look at, at it is, you've got what you wanna do and you've got what, what they want to see happen, what their goal is, and then you've got a budget and a timeline. And as, as a public artist, you're balancing all of those variables to bring them together. And um, for me, a, a key way of doing that is digging into the history of the area. and and trying to find some aspect of, of what it is that is significant and the clues come from, from that call and, and those couple of sentences that tie you in and, and then you learn about that place and you do research and, and I try and keep objects um, out of that part of the process and just do research and learn history. And then um, a story starts to evolve and you find a way to tie in what you're interested in and what they're interested in. And if you can create a narrative or tell a story about how those things relate, um, then it connects them to what you're trying to communicate. And um, that builds a bridge. And that's uh, um, a, a very um, effective way to tie in what you're interested in to, to what they're interested in. So um, that's you know the most the most direct function of how how a narrative functions in relation to public art. And Leslie, uh, uh, same for for you. If you could talk to some of those um, nuts and bolts uh, for public uh, art, and perhaps even working within a team environment too. Sure. Okay. I want to mention something. If you're gonna if you're gonna um, sign up to cafe or to Cotta Works, you're going to see a theme, uh, not just in how these requests are normally formatted. So some of that gets easier because it it's a little bit redundant sometimes and you kind of know the flow of the questioning of what they're looking for for the site. But there is two big differences 
there's a request for qualifications, which is kind of what Mark mentioned. And then there's a request for concept. And I know when I was starting out, and I'm assuming this is still, you know, very much the two big divides, but a request for concept typically means they want you to do a lot of that legwork ahead of time. They want to see some research, probably even sketches and budgets. So it's almost like you're handing them as much of the unrefined version of what you're going to do as you can do with your time without getting paid and still convince them that's a good idea. So, and, and I typically would see that with lower um, price points. So it's kind of a good entry point for a lot of new artists because you can say, hey, I haven't done anything quite like this before, but I've got this really cool idea. And you've got a chance to convey that without maybe having like the best portfolio built up so far. But ideally, you get to a point where your portfolio can speak for itself a little bit and you don't have so much of a time investment just to put your name in the hat. So that would be more of a request for qualification. And then once they say, oh, yeah, hey, you know, they've done some pretty cool stuff, then you get into that research um, process. And a lot of times as a finalist, you do get a stipend to go ahead and do a little bit of that and maybe create some nice visuals for the committee to see. So, um, so there is, there is a difference there and you'll kind of see that as you, as you get into all of this, but um, once you're getting into whatever the serious discussion is, maybe it's your very first, you know, application step, or maybe you've gone through this finalist process, you're going to start to focus in on what they really need to see from you. So obviously budget is a really big one and timeline and narrative. Um, and one thing I wanted to speak to with narrative is a lot of times the more experience you get building stuff, at least for me, you start to see that the committee wants to know kind of logistically, how is this going to look? So what I try to include sometimes in these narratives is the concept. And if I can squeeze in a little about me so they can kind of get a sense of maybe who I am as the maker, that's helpful. Um, but also kind of getting in some sort of paragraph or two about what finish are you going to use? How long could you expect that to last? Maybe what maintenance there would be? Um, what sort of questions do you still have for the site? And maybe what decisions you would want to make once those questions are answered? And it, it just really helps the committee know that you're thinking through every step here. And it's not that you necessarily have to have every answer right off the bat. Um, but this is how far you've gotten and this is how you think you'd pursue it unless you're given different information than what you're assuming. So I think that does help to put in the narrative for these types of calls. And, um, and then one thing I wanna speak to, so permitting, that's gonna be so site specific, just assume that that could be a potential cost. I will always ask the committee, hey, if we're gonna install this on public land, do we have the okay to go ahead and do this? Are you guys gonna handle the, the permitting on that? Or is that something you want me to do? And you can kind of get through some of that nitty gritty up front before you need to maybe plan out, you know, executing that step. Um, maybe they even know what kind of permit you need to pull. So you don't need to necessarily know all of this just right off the bat. Um, insurance. So when I first started renting space in a warehouse to be a metal worker, I had to have liability insurance. So I went shopping for that um, just numbers wise. When I was first starting, I had a little studio and I think I paid like 600 a year, which is a really good price right now because I teach and because I've added some different um, components onto that insurance. It's risen up a bit. I think I'm at like 130 a month. And that would, that would get more intense the bigger the business grows and if I have employees and stuff. But having to really bite that bullet to begin with and figure out a way to finance that just as overhead for the year made it really easy for me to apply to these calls because I already had insurance. And that can be one of those scare you off right off the bat sort of elements for an artist that doesn't have that yet. And it's really expensive if you think you're applying for a call and you haven't gotten paid and all of a sudden, you know, you've got to provide the insurance. But sometimes it's worth financing that if you get to that contract stage because you know you're about to be under contract and maybe you can afford it at that point. Um, I have worked 
in some um, temporary exhibitions for outdoor sculpture. I don't do them as much now because I would need to essentially have inventory of sculptures that I rotate all over the state or the country or I keep in storage. And I just kind of found that if you make really big stuff, you've got to find a place to keep it all. So I don't do as many of those, but they can be really fun and committees are a little more lenient in concepts and form because they're not committing to owning that and maintaining it for ever and ever. They're just gonna see it for a year or two. So I think that can be a, a nice way to kind of dip your toes in the water and get some work built up, but you don't get paid a lot for it. It's more like a rental fee is kind of how it shakes down um, to put that out in the world. But some of these agencies will provide liability insurance for some of these temporary exhibitions. And I know when I was getting started, that helped so much. Some of them will even help you with installation and they're handling their permitting and their equipment rentals. So I think that is one um, great tip even for anybody in an administrative role to know that there could be some entry points for new artists if some of these, you know, structural components were helped by the bigger organizations. Um, so that's just some ideas and experiences for me. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And, and Greg, I know you've worked with teams you are a giant team really um, in and of yourself, <laughs> but, but artists who have not necessarily tied in with a fabricator or an installer or, or a, a, a team, it, it, talk about that a little bit and how they move forward with that and how somebody like yourself uh, or Leslie or, or Mark or somebody could really help uh, an artist sort of develop that team and, and, and address some of the budgeting and the engineering and, and uh, so okay. forth. Well, we're, we're only seven people, <laughs> so, so we're pretty small <laughs> compared to, to compared to a lot of my competition. We're really small. Um, sorry. Uh, so on the fabrication side, we just have a number of fabricators around the country, actually, that we work with. But I think locally, the, once you start to get your design sort of shaped up, it's really a matter of finding um, maybe local fabricators that match up with the, the techniques that you might need for for your for your sculpture. So if it's it's metal work, you know, I think Mark could probably speak to this more better than. Sorry, um, he is doing some wonderful metal work, but I, I think it's just finding finding local fabricators that have the expertise for the different parts. It isn't necessarily, in our case, it's usually one big fabrication firm building everything, but there's a lot of specialty fabricators that do different parts of it. So it, it might end up being that you've got a number of fabricators that, that you're managing to be able to do that. But that doing early budgeting is I think really the key you know it's this iterative budgeting as soon as you've got a concept close enough to be able to budget that's that's something we try to do and I, that's something that we could could help with um, on on projects so it, it's um, is it really the budgeting what you wanted me to speak to all of all of those, it's working with the team and the budgeting and the the the, the permitting. How do you find a fabricator? Okay. So, on actually, on most of our projects, since they're in science centers or children's museums, we're not really dealing with the permitting because it's there. It, it, it's usually part of a of a bigger project. The one thing that we do have to do a lot of times is have things UL listed, so we'll have to. Um, we will have to have a, a UL representative come in if it has electromechanical in it. Uh, I don't know that that's needed really for, for public art. Um, the, the installation is typically in our case is handled by the, the fabricator and we're just on site as part of construction administration to help them get that, get that installed. Um, I've, you know, our, just listening to, to Mark and Leslie, our projects are, are a bit different because of they're usually whole exhibitions. So they're, they're, we, we really are usually with more just one, one or two fabricators. But um, 
I think the key is matching up the fabricator to the type of art that you want to do. You know, if it's if it's optical with light, there's fabricators that are really great at designing custom light fixtures and, and, and designing custom lighting systems. If it's got moving parts and you know, things are happening with it, there's great fabricators that do, that have really great engineers and are, are, are really good at doing that kind of, of engineering to help to help you out. The further that you can get the design concept dialed in before you, you know, as you go to budgeting, your numbers are gonna be much tighter as you go along. So if, if you come up with something, if you come in with something that's just a napkin sketch, you're, it's already going to have a built-in, you know, they're going to, they're going to build in a big fudge factor, but the, the tighter that your concept is as you go in, your numbers are going to be more and more realistic. Is that helpful? I, well, it's up to the, the group here, but, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I, I think if, if, how does an artist get to a, f a fabricator is it you know do, do, do they just google fabricators oh, or oh i'm sorry no. so if if you have a design um i would if i were doing this locally i would if i was doing something metal work wise i would be going around and visiting metal fabrication shops with my design talking to them. If I, if I needed something that had wood, I'd be, I'd be looking at, you know, wood fabricators. Unfortunately, in our area, we don't, we, as I know of, we don't have one stop large, you know, fabrication shops that have everything in house, that kind of specialty work in house. But I, I think it's building relationships with you know, different, different fabricators, different metal work. If you tend to work in metal, building relationships with those, because what we have found in, in our world is that you know, different fabricators have different expertise. Every metal, every metal worker is not the same. Some of them view, if you come up with some you know, wild idea that they've never done before, but their mindset is to, around problem solving and helping make that happen, you're gonna to start to build a good relationship with them. You know, I've worked with fabricators that if it's not cut and dry, we're really not interested in, in working on that. I don't, um, so it, it's a relationship building thing, guys, at least for us. I mean, there, in our world, there's probably about 12 good fabricators and we only work with two of them because you know, we've built long-term relationships with we know we can trust them to do a good job. So we need to probably the next uh, Zoom meeting do a speed dating with artists and fabricators, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, we're talking about teams because our artists who have not done public art are probably going to team up with somebody. Um, David, if you, if you could take a look at, um, how would you look at someone's qualifications who applied as a team? Let's say someone who has not done public art, but maybe has applied with someone like a Mark or, uh, or, or applied with somebody who is a fabricator and perhaps an installer as a team. When you look at that, somebody who has not necessarily done public art, but has got a team that is capable of doing it. What, what are your thoughts when you look at that on the um, on an RFQ basis as uh, somebody who is on a committee to review these? I think the best way to uh, describe it is uh, typically, at least in our art commission, uh, we have discussions where we do want to have new artists. We certainly support uh, existing public art artists, but uh, always encourage, you know, new artists to come online. And so once we see a concept from a new artist, we're always intrigued. And then the next problem is, and, and it is a big problem, is that completion of the work, warranty of the work, making sure that it will environmentally live the length of time uh, the artist says it will, is always an issue. So those factors go into how we look at the experienced artist who's teaming up with the new artist. Uh, we unfortunately uh, we spend half our day in our commission meetings talking about uh, repair and replace uh, of existing art that we've already bought. And it's not a pleasant discussion. 
<laughs> uh, we were very dis disappointed and uh, it really is sad. So going forward, every time we've had the opportunity to have a, a, a team come before us, we're really looking for uh, an experienced uh, artist. Obviously, if it's an artist that's done work in the area that we can physically go see, uh, that's important. Uh, we want to see what that work looks like uh, years after it's been installed. And, and, and that's one of the biggest concerns that we have. Uh, our maintenance uh, budget is ever growing for our art, public art collection in St. Petersburg. And uh, I think going forward, that's probably going to be one of the things that we're more cautious about is, you know, it's a great looking piece. It looks wonderful. What happens when you put it outside? Um, does the wind kill it? Does the sun kill it? Um, are the materials really rated the, to the level that they respect? Um, you know, those are the things that we trust the, the experienced uh, artist to uh, fulfill. Uh, and so that's uh, at least to date where, where we are. Um, you know, so that's, that's how I would look at it. Uh, if you have a prior experience work that uh, say, you know, a new artist and uh, experience artist has already done. I'm sure that's going to go a long way. Uh, we'd like to see that team, ha ha you know, having worked together, that would help uh, instill some uh, satisfaction on our part that, you know, uh, the collaboration can, can work on this particular project that we're proposing. There was, uh, we can go to um, questions because we don't want to go too far over time. I know we've, we've got about 20 minutes. Uh, there is a question in the um, chat there about um, addressing um, cities or vendor, uh, cities or municipalities that require um, artists to be licensed and bonded and insured, just like another uh, vendor. I know the city of St. Petersburg would require you to register as a vendor through the city's um, some kind of system um, where you register as a vendor and that's how a paycheck or how a check gets cut. Um, but if one of the um, artists could talk to, you know, how do you, um, how do you deal with some of those requirements as being a licensed and bonded uh, vendor with the city? Is, is that something that you've run into that is a requirement? And then maybe we can cut to uh, questions if that's okay. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to jump in on that. Um, you know, when when I first uh, started MGA Sculpture Studio in St. Louis, and this is the better part of, gosh, almost 30 years ago, um, it's fresh out of graduate school and the, the notion of, uh, I, I got a job with Anheuser-Busch and they would not write me a check to me. So the only way that I could get paid was to have an account that had a business name associated with it. And that opened up a whole can of worms. Um, I had to get a business license. And in order to get a business license, I had to get an occupancy permit. And, and then I had to get insurance and so on and so forth. And all of these things transpired. And it was all very intimidating and frightened me to death, frankly. Um, kind of like the first house you buy. Um, then after you've done it a few times, it doesn't freak you out anymore. But it, you know, there's there's a big difference. This is probably the biggest difference uh, between a public artist and an artist that sells their work through a third party. Um, it's a business. This is a business endeavor, and you have to be established as a business. You have to be willing to take that leap. So. Um, you you need to get a business license and and get insurance and and these kinds of things. I mean, th there are ways to work around this, but they're stop gaps, and you're not going to get very far. So um, you can you can get your feet wet by by working around a little bit, um, but if you're going to move forward, it you have to to take this plunge, and um, you know that's that's the price of admission, unfortunately, is, is being, being willing to be a grown-up artist, be an adult, and, and uh, you know, 
make make the commitment to make this your thing and what you're going to do is is ultimately what it comes down to. We can talk about the nuts and bolts of that and 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 what it means and how you find your insurance and and all of these different components. Um, but it's taking that step. You got to you got to step over the threshold is what it comes down to. Another question here in the um, chat is what goes into your statement of intent in the initial RFQ prior to being chosen to submit a full proposal? Um, I see Leslie nodding right away. <laughs> um, you know, to my recollection, generally it is an acknowledgement of some of the uniqueness of that site and maybe how you specifically could be responding to that. So maybe a little bit about, you know, your, your practice as an artist and what you bring to the table and how you assume you would enter this conversation with the art committee and work towards developing your project for them. And, you know, and then you get into kind of your research phase like Mark had mentioned before and you can get into more detail if you're a finalist. Does anyone else have some input on that though. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I, I don't want to dominate, but I'll, 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 I'm happy to chime in on that. Um, so I, over the years, I have developed basically a form letter um, and it's got the stuff that I want to communicate about my process in it. And then there are about four or five sentences within that form letter that you look for clues in that application as to <laughs> what that commissioning body is looking for and what they're interested in. And you use those four or five sentences to tie what you do into what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, the first time you write this, this uh, this letter of interest, it will take you days, <laughs> if not weeks, and you, you can spend months refining it, but you hit a point where um, you might have two, three, four of them, but you can pull one of those and within a couple hours, um, comb through that application and insert the, the correct information and you can, you can get it down to a, a pretty efficient process. Um, but you want to communicate what it is that's unique about what you do, where your value lies, how you work, and um, and then tie that into what they're interested in. And um, you got to be a good writer. Um, that's that's part of the game. You got to be able to verbally sell that narrative and that that story. And at that point, your story is is you and who you are and what you know, or your team. And, and tie that together, you know? Uh, there's another question here in the chat about um, uh, a, an individual mural artist getting workers' comp insurance, which I'm not an insurance expert, but I, I don't believe an individual uh, needs workers' comp. Um, can anybody? Uh... Yeah, um, if you work by yourself, you don't have any employees, you can be exempt for workers' comp. So that's, that's no big deal. You can go online and, um, you know, submit a, you know, an application to be exempt uh, with the state of Florida. Um, uh, but to have uh, employees, well, that's another situation there, yeah. I can't remember what the, the break off is, how many employees, if anybody knows offhand. Yeah, I don't remember right now. Hi, this is, this is John. We just went through this last year when we added our fourth employee, we had to get workman's comp. So under four, you're okay. And John, when we do Shine Mural Fest each year, uh, how does that, that work? Our overall insurance policy is probably a bit higher than most here because of that. Yeah. They're covered through our general liability. Okay. And the other was, could somebody please uh, itemize the steps involved from start to completion of a project? Um, a, a rather um, open-ended question. <laughs> Who would like to tackle that? Uh, the steps involved from start to completion of a public art project. I've got a, a condensed version of that um, that I can go through pretty quickly. There's, of course, variables here, but generally what you're looking at is 
you start with an RFQ, um, you put your name in the hat through your, your letter and uh, your resume and your images. The first round, they're primarily evaluating your images. They call out a huge number of people based on what they see. Then, then generally panels will start looking at specifics of your resume and, and your letter and get into the brass tacks. And that gets that number down into a, a manageable amount. Um, then they pick a short list. If you get shortlisted, then you generally you, um, and I say generally because there are trends that are, that are constantly shifting and evolving in the public art process. But generally they're asking you to put a concept together. You get a small amount of money. Um, this is where, you know, you get anywhere from 500 to, to $5,000 as a stipend for your, your design time um, or your concepting time. And that's when you wanna go all out. Um, I generally spend two to four times what I get on that process because you're, instead of having a, a one in, in 200 chance, you've now got a one out of four, one out of three chance. Those are good odds. It's worth making an investment in that. You got a, a $100,000, $200,000 budget. It's worth spending $5,000 on. Um, that's my business's perspective on that. So um, then you make your pitch, uh, you get an opportunity, you put your concept together and you pitch it. And um, I, we call it a pitch packet and generally it's images. Um, we used to make models, we don't do that anymore. Everything is uh, 3D renderings. Um, the better you can create that environment and put your piece in that environment and make your surfaces and your textures communicate accurately, the, the more convincing your pitch is. Um, if you're very lucky and you get that project, then you go into contract negotiations and you work through contract. And sometimes there's back and forth. Sometimes you get a, a commissioning body that says, this is your contract. You don't like it. We're going with somebody else. So it, there's variables there. Sometimes you can read through the contract and, and, and negotiate a little bit. Once you get through the contract, then um, you're, you go into technical design and that process involves engineering. And now you're taking that concept and you are doing the, the design work that makes it a reality. You're putting full dimensions to your materials and working in all, all your connection points. And you're, you're working with a structural engineer and he's telling you how beer wells have to be and, and what kind of footer you need under the piece and, and all of these kinds of things. You don't know a little bit about that process. This is where you can get yourself in trouble because you can pitch something that you can't build for the budget that you have. So this takes some experience. Um, once you get through that part, you get into fabrication and you're either looking for a fabricator or like my studio, which is somewhat unique in the public art realm. We, we make all our own stuff or at least probably 95% of it. Um, so you're, you're actually physically manifesting and through that contract, you work up a payment schedule and you have benchmarks that you have to meet. Ideally, you wanna get those payments to work out so that you're not fronting capital to produce that piece. Generally, your profit is in the final payment that comes at the back end when the piece is in and approved. Every commissioning body has slightly different variables for what they want. Um, in, in those deliverables. Some want full photographic information and there's copyright conversations and, and maintenance schedules and all of these kinds of things that are deliverables in, in order to get your, your final money. But once you get through your fabrication, then you've got an installation process and either you're doing that or you're commissioning uh, another entity to transport the piece and then install the piece. And um, that in a nutshell is how the process plays out. That's for, for public art that's three-dimensional murals, of course. A lot of those processes are much simpler. The engineering doesn't exist and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a simpler process to go through, but, but that's, that's the gist. Uh, we got another question here um, about um, W9s. Can uh, anybody speak to that as a, a, an individual artist? Can you hire somebody on a W9 basis or must you be registered as a business and, and have you done that? Anyone? No, we, uh, we don't have uh, assistance that way. We work with uh, other companies sometimes like, uh, you know, we try to do everything in house, but sometimes we have to work with uh, third parties 
and hire other companies like you know welders and a power power coding uh, companies so we don't really have like uh, assistance all the time with us like mar does i think so not not sure about that uh, the w9 so i would add to that that um a way to deal with that scenario is a 1099 and subcontracted services. So um, it's it's much more affordable and efficient um, to to subcontract your uh, your help and your you know other other entities. If you're subbing out work, then you're you know you and you exceed six hundred dollars, and the federal government requires you to file a 1099 for those services. Um, and I forget exactly what the cutoff is for businesses, whether you have to file a 1099 or not. That's something that my accountant handles. Um, but uh, W-9 is basically bringing on employees. And there's a, a whole kit and caboodle that goes with that as far as responsibilities. Um, let's see here, another question here about estimated numbers, percentages for budgeting for profit loss in theory, what percentage is paid to you out of the project and how much uh, do you keep extra potential? So I, I guess, is there a contingency? And then what uh, actually gets paid to the artist as the artist fee? Is there a, a standard that you all work with? Mm, I think that's tricky. For me, the artist fee has to do with the size of the budget. So I assume the artist fee is not just coming up with a concept ahead of time, but also um, all the design work and the logistical planning for fabrication and stuff like that, that's going to happen within the shop step by step. Um, so I don't necessarily have a percentage. I normally throw at that. That really varies depending on how complicated the project is. Um, and also how much I'm going to be doing a lot of back and forth discussion. So if it's a type of process where I'm in a much more collaborative conversation and I need to be attending a lot of meetings or, um, you know, just re maybe even redesigning along the way at certain steps, then I, I do want to make sure I've got um, a, a good enough fee to handle those more administrative costs. And um, and what I'll do when I go through budgets is if I can pin down numbers, that's really great. The market shifts, metal prices change every day. Um, maybe access to a certain, you know, subcontractor or in installation assistance or something like that may change. And so if I can ballpark that number and give myself a little bit of a contingency per item, per um, itemized portion of the budget that helps a lot and it normally shakes out about even once you get doing this a bit some stuff will be maybe a little more economical than you had predicted and other things will be a little more expensive and then um, you know but I think contingencies are important with stuff like this so that you're not losing money in the end you've got something there to pay in case something changes and then profit varies too. Profits really dependent on the size of the job. Um, I'd say really a sliding scale between 10 and 20, maybe even 25% if um, you're not going to have a lot of payout with your fabrication costs or something, but it's a complicated project. But I feel like that gets into gray area too with maybe some of that artist fee administrative fee. Um, I'm all ears too, though, if other people kind of handle that differently. My father was a general contractor and a lot of my understanding of how to budget sort of works well in that, um, that building field. Thank you all so much. We'll uh, turn it back over to uh, John Collins with the St. Petersburg Arts Alliance. This wouldn't be possible without uh, John and the Arts Alliance. They do an awful lot of uh, stuff on behalf of the city and on behalf of the artists in this community. Um, they do a terrific job of it and are, are a tremendous um, support system. And um, I would encourage you to get involved with the Arts Alliance um, as a potential yeah. public artist. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Wayne. Thank you all for coming. I actually have an artist knocking on my door, so I'm going to be very short and sign <laughs> off early. It's, it's a terrific uh, job that we have here supporting the artists, the nonprofit and the for-profit 
community, including the performing arts. So I think this is being recorded. I will send the link out to everybody who's on it. And if anybody who signed up couldn't make it, we'll get that to them as well. And we appreciate particularly all of our panelists donating their time. So everybody just let's give us a one for our panelists. Thank you very much. And I will sign off now. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. day.